Hello! Hi, Chris! Thank you so much for being here. We're gonna know more about Dr. Jellery tonight. I'm Jellery Stenbachen. I am an anesthesiologist. I've been practicing since 2003 in Northern Colorado. I am married and have been, this all, I think this will be 29 years in August. And uh, I have two children. And one of them is, she is actually graduating this year and going to be going on to college in the fall. And I have a 12 year old. Anesthesiologist, amazing. So, which only means one thing, you've gone through the whole process of pre-med, of medical school, residency and all of that. I just wanted to know, how did you get into medicine doc? Was there someone in the family who's like in the well, medical? Yes, actually, you know, traditionally I'm, I'm Filipino. And so, so, you know, that my family are all nurses. I have nurses, medical technologists, scientists, physicians, dentists. I have so many relatives and my parents are actually physicians also. And so oh, wow. when I came, they immigrated here from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And for several years, they actually had to spend time working not as physicians because they were mm -hmm. trying to pass the flex exam. Mm -hmm. And so they did a variety of other things, but they are both physicians. And so they were my example. And ever since I was young, I wanted to be a, a physician. I actually wanted to do that up until I went to college. I was also a pre-med when I went to college. Mm -hmm. I went to this small liberal arts college in Nebraska because ah. my parents were working in Kansas in the underserved areas there. And so mm -hmm. I went there called Union College in Lincoln, Nebraska. They actually have a great PA program and also a nursing program. Anyway, I went there and I uh, did my degree was medical technology. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that I got all the pre-med requirements. And that was one of those degrees that had that already included. And in addition to that, I thought, well, in case I decide not to go into medicine, right. I can also do medical technology and that, that sure. would be a good career. There's a lot of things that went into me deciding not to go into medicine at that time. I was told that it was going to be hard to get into medical school and difficult for a woman to be in medicine. And, and I think mm -hmm. at the time I thought, you're trying to discourage me from doing that. Then I realize now after all of what I've been through, they were just trying to tell me that's just the way it is and trying to get me yeah. prepared. I decided not to go into medicine at that time and, and I got married. And then, <laughs> and then I went and practiced medical technology for about three years. Oh. But two years into that, I realized I wasn't satisfied with what I was mm -hmm. doing for medical technology. It just wasn't enough hands-on work and contact with mm -hmm. patients. And so I rethought what I wanted to do. And so I actually researched going to be a nurse. Um, wow. a clinical, <laughs> yeah, a clinical perfusionist. I looked at physical therapy. I looked at a variety of things. And I just kept coming back to medicine. I just felt like this was really something I could do and that I would enjoy doing. And so that's what I did. I went, went to medical school after three years of working as a medical technologist. And I ended up going to the University of Nebraska and oh, so going to medical school there. Yeah. My husband had actually been working as a public relations person at Union College in Lincoln, Nebraska. And at the time, I didn't really have very many options in terms of where I could go to school if I wanted him to come along with me. So that he wanted to keep his job. So I got accepted into the medical school at University of Nebraska and I actually commuted an hour there wow. and back for the first two years and then the third and fourth year are the years where you actually rotate through different yeah. specialties and mm -hmm. so some of those rotations were in Lincoln Nebraska so I didn't have to commute as much and so uh, yeah it was good I mean it was a lot of work it was worth it I probably wouldn't want to do that again that way but it was still <laughs> It was still worth it. Then we moved to Omaha, Nebraska when I uh, mm -hmm. did my residency there for mm -hmm. anesthesia. And anesthesia residency, first it's one year of being an intern that's in internal mm -hmm. medicine or whatever general medicine year that usually is acceptable. And then three years of anesthesia training after that. And then after I was done with anesthesia training, I didn't choose to do anything as a fellowship. And so I ended up mm -hmm. practicing here in Northern Colorado. And with both of your parents being physicians, were they both in anesthesia or they're in different mm -hmm. specialties? No, they're general practice, family general practice, practice, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there a pressure for you growing up with two physician parents? Like, did they tell you, oh, you have to go into medicine? Yeah. My, well, my dad, not so <laughs> no. much. My mom, I think there was kind of a, I think she was kind of pushing uh, that I should do medicine. Mm -hmm. And I I intentionally didn't take my MCAT my junior year because I didn't want to have that pressure there that, well, you took the MCAT. Why didn't you go ahead and apply for medical school? So yeah. I, I took all my prereqs and I didn't take my MCAT until when I decided to go back 
to try to get into medical school. So. so when you first talked, Dr. Jellery, you said it's very important for you that the right people to get into medicine. I've actually been holding on to this question. What do you mean by the right people go into medicine? Do you think that there's people who are predestined to go into medicine? They have a set amount or a set mix of personalities or outlook in life or whatnot? You know, when I said that, I only meant that there are some people who go into medicine for the wrong reasons. <laughs> and so I think that if you go into medicine for the wrong reasons, then you might be disillusioned by what is happening in medicine right now. If you know that you're going into medicine because you want to help other people and be altruistic and to be able to make a difference in someone's personal health and life and quality of life, then that's a good thing. And you know that it's going to require a lot of hard work and dedication and sometimes some sacrifices in, in your family life and just life in general. General, there's some things that you have to give up temporarily to be able to achieve what you need to achieve. I was going to say in that short period of time, <laughs> yeah. it's not really that no short. You're short. <laughs> so, so you do have to also pace yourself and mm -hmm. so that you have a good quality of life while you're going on this journey. The thing that I think is tough for some people is when they go into it thinking that it's going to be a job where it's good. It's, it isn't for the money. Medicine is just not for the money. I actually had a relative who was getting started going to go into starting college. And I said, well, what do you want to go into? And that person said, well, I want to go into medicine. And I said, well, well, why would you want to do that? Well, my dad says it's a good thing to get into because it's a steady job and you get good money. And I just was like, well, well. You know, I think that that's a really bad answer to this question because mm -hmm. it's really important when you spend 12 years of your life of training, 12 to 17 mm -hmm. years of training, yeah. education. And What's to the debt as well? Debt, it really isn't worth it because you have to think about when you come out of medical school, you have debt now on an average of $245,000. Mm -hmm. So when you have that kind of debt, it's hard to get out of that debt. Yeah. I mean, you have to be pretty disciplined to get out of that debt. But if yeah. you know that's what you want, it's all worth it. It's all mm -hmm. worth doing. It's just a matter of your mindset, why you're wanting to accomplish this. Because I've mm -hmm. seen plenty of people who've been burned out, are unhappy with where they are. Like, is this it? Is this what I have to deal with? Hospital mm -hmm. administration, talking <laughs> about, you know, more and more patients to see and, you know, getting the numbers and not necessarily taking care of the people. And, and yeah. you know, some of those things you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And some of it doesn't seem worth it when you just go into it for the money. I agree. Given that the road to medicine is not short at all, it is long, it's arduous, it's stressful, there's a lot of money involved. Now, like having practiced for so many years, do you have any regrets in going to this path? No, I don't really have any regrets because I mean, this is my second career. So, I mean, I already kind of knew what I was going to be up against before I went into medicine. And I had already seen how the things that my parents did, how their work affected their lives. And so for me, it was, I already knew what to expect. But at the same time, I also have done things to try to keep myself from burning out. Yeah. And I, I guess the one thing I do regret is when I first had my baby, my first baby, I had just gotten out of residency. I think I only maybe got two months off to be mm. with her before I started full-time work. And I was mm. working about 70 to 80 hours a week. Mm. And so it was really a tough time for me. And in fact, some people thought my husband at church was a single dad because they would always see him <laughs> oh and they didn't see me. And so they were yeah. like, well, he's got this little baby. It took a lot for those first three years. And after that, I switched groups. I changed to a different group. Mm -hmm. And when I interviewed for them, I basically said, I do not want to work full time. Can you mm -hmm. work on me not being full time? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we can't have you be part time immediately. But mm -hmm. in the next couple of years, we can probably get you to be part time. And, and mm -hmm. so they kept their promise. And I've been with them since 2007. Wow. So yes, yeah, so I've enjoying my work. And, and I like being an anesthesiologist. And it just has a lot of variety. I transitioned just this last January, I decided I don't want to work overnight anymore. So if I can give away my call to someone else who wants to make the money and do the call, then I give it away. So it's a good thing. I'm glad. With all of that being said, what is the one piece of advice that you would want to tell any student who's wanting to pursue medicine, whether they're pre-med or they're medical students now, even those in residency? Well, in terms of pre-med, a couple things. One is that you just have to do the best you can or whatever classes you're taking mm -hmm. because obviously your grades matter not to punt on any class even if it's an easy class even if it's a boring yeah. class just get as good a grades as you can mm -hmm. because those grades make a difference in where you can go and what you can do and then the other thing is 
to just have, take some time as a pre-med student to ask all the questions that you need to ask of people. Find out what doctors really do. I mean, some of the things, it's not the same. What you see on TV is not what ha is not the life. Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy is not it. So it's not just, it. you have to ask hard questions like, honestly, what's your life like? You know, mm -hmm. do you have time to spend with your family? What do you enjoy doing? And to figure out what specialty you want to do, especially in medical school, it's hard to figure out what you want. But even then, when you're in medical medical schools, sometimes you still change yeah. your direction. And so I was supposed to be an ophthalmology, wow. um, but there's a thing called the match yeah. in med school. When you find out your fourth year, you rank schools and residencies and they rank you. And then they put all that together. And then you find out on <laughs> where, where you go. But uh, I did not match in ophthalmology mm -hmm. and I ended up matching, ended up getting a position for anesthesia. And all in all, it turned out to be the best decision. I'm just so glad. I mean, I was devastated when it happened. But, you know, you just have to roll with it. And, and it just turned out to be a much better choice for me in terms of just everything about anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm very thankful that it happened that way. Thank you so much. So you said that you didn't do any fellowships. So what I'm getting from that is there's different types of anesthesiologists. I know there's those who like do induction for cardiothoracic surgery versus pregnancy giving birth. Yeah. So there are different subspecialties. And depending on the subspecialty, it's a year or two years. And mm -hmm. so some of the them include obstetrics, pain management, regional anesthesia, cardiothoracic mm -hmm. anesthesia, and also pediatric anesthesia. Mm -hmm. But you can also be a generalist like me. So I do quite a few cases, but I don't do any cardiothoracic or neonatal peds mm -hmm. cases. So I don't do those. Got it. What do you think is the bread and butter of anesthesiology? Like how does a usual day look like? Like what are the working hours? I think most surgeries are like scheduled, but let's say yes. for emergency surgeries, who gets okay. to decide which anesthesiologist goes into the operating room? Well, it's just a matter of who's on call. And so mm -hmm. uh, depending on what, how the hospital sets up call for our hospital, we have cases assigned for the day. And then we have a supervising anesthesiologist who is kind of the anesthesia in charge where they direct who does what. If an emergency comes and they're the ones who respond to any emergency situations or if they or if somebody in OB needs an epidural. And then oftentimes we have somebody who is an add-on person who handles all the add-ons in the hospital. And then if there is overflow, like a trauma that needs to go emergently to surgery, the supervising anesthesiologist will go to the trauma and start the procedure. And then when there's a break in a room, then that person will go into that room and will, then the other room is paused. Mm -hmm. So it. it's just a matter of, of however they run the, the board. So. Got it. And are you in a physician only group? Or you also no. are NACE and AAs as well? No. So we are uh, anesthesiologists and CRNAs. So there's probably 50 physicians. I thought they said 48 CRNAs that are on staff. And then we also have as needed PRN people. Mm -hmm. And so we do an anesthesia care team model usually at the mm -hmm. hospital. And occasionally we'll also have physicians doing their own cases, such as cardiothoracic cases. Mm -hmm. Depending on where we are for surgery centers, we'll have physicians uh, supervising nurse anesthetists mm -hmm. or uh, physicians doing their own cases mm -hmm. if there's only one anesthesiologist required at the, at the surgery center. And I think we can segue this conversation to CRNAs. So what is the main difference or the differences between, you know, aside from the education, the training, of course, during surgeries between the responsibilities of physician anesthesiologists and CRNAs. So the differences in terms of education, we, we said there's the 12 years of well of college and then four years of medical school. And then for us, it's four years of residency. Mm -hmm. uh, nurse anesthetists do have a nursing degree. They usually mm -hmm. spend a year in critical care. And mm -hmm. then they do, their requirement is like 600 cases. And I think mm -hmm. they do about 2,000 clinical hours. And mm -hmm. physicians do like 12,000 to six, 16,000 clinical hours. And we do about between probably about 1,500 cases for our training. For us, for when we do scheduling for our cases here at at the hospitals. Usually the cases are for mostly patients who are other than cardiothoracic cases. Mm -hmm. Nurse anesthetists are usually in mm -hmm. those cases. 
Mm -hmm. but it's it varies for different facilities yeah i think there are still some maybe in the western midwest where it's just physician only facilities as of right now i think because here in new york at least where i'm from there is a mix of that care team model where there's the teamwork between the physicians and the crnas and if you are willing to talk about a flaming topic um oh boy oh boy boy. (laughs) actually there was an outbreak on twitter about this i think a few weeks ago and it's the concept of just a very important topic it's the concept of patient safety regards to anesthesiologists versus crnas who are doing the induction or just overseeing surgeries with anesthesia i want to know what's your thoughts on that doc well you know i think that nurse anesthetists are an important part of being able to provide anesthesia in this country. And I don't think that's ever going to change. Mm -hmm. But as an anesthesiologist, I do believe also that it's important for us to have a supervisory role. And Mm -hmm. of course, there's going to be nurse anesthetists who are going to disagree with that and want to independently Mm -hmm. practice. So I think that that's just going to be somewhere a thing that we're just going to have to agree to disagree. I know that there was recently a study, it said something about 6.9 excess deaths per 1,000 cases in which there was an anesthesia or a surgical complication that occurred that a physician anesthesiologist was able to prevent mm-hmm. and it was it was an independent study that was done mm-hmm. i think patient safety is really important and i think that an anesthesia care team model is a is a good model Got now it. i do i do know that there are areas where crna can practice independently but mm-hmm. also that i don't know if some of those physicians who work with those nurse anesthetists who practice independently if they realize that when something does go wrong mm-hmm. or if there is complication then the surgeon or whoever is the physician involved in the case is usually the one who's going to be responsible got it got it thank you so much for answering that question it's a very sensitive topic for a lot of people honestly as you mentioned earlier doc thousands and thousands of training hours and cases do you remember the very first time that you administered anesthesia to a patient and how was that how was that experience well i mean the first time i ever did anything with anesthesia was when i was actually on anesthesia rotation i was a medical student and then the attending told me he's like get in there and i said but i haven't ever done this before out loud in front of a patient and I was just and he, <laughs> and, um, that was pretty embarrassing because then I was like well maybe I shouldn't have said that and that's that's the thing about when you're learning something or when you're training you don't ever just say I have no idea what I'm doing yeah. you, that's just not something you say I mean you have to be truthful but you don't have to say that so I, that, that was the first time I remember and also I, that I couldn't see, I didn't understand, I didn't see what I was supposed to be seeing to put the breathing tube yeah, in. So. For sure. Yeah, I remember too, I think they were my orientation as a new nurse. They wanted me to insert an IV in the patient. I'm like, and I didn't know the patient was right behind me because they went to the bathroom. I was like, I don't, I've never put in an IV. And the patient's like, no, 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 this isn't <laughs> happening right now. So I agree, we shouldn't have said those things. What do you think is the most, of all the years you've been practicing, is there one memory as a physician that I guess most exciting or the wildest thing that you've seen or the scariest thing you've seen in practice so far? Um, I'll give you two. So one time I was watching Grey's Anatomy or some ridiculous thing like that with my husband. And there was a scene in which somebody was resuscitating a patient and the patient was on a gurney. And then the doctor jumped on the gurney and was doing chest compression. And I just said to my husband, there is no way that that ever happens in real life. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's ridiculous. But then one day I was just finishing up a case and I was heading out the door and I see somebody standing in the doorway and they said, Dr. Stenbach, and they need you in the PACU, in the recovery room. And so I start walking over there and then about 10 feet later, someone else says, Dr. Stenbach, and they need you in the PACU. And I start walking a little faster and then I saw someone else like signaling me, like (laughs) go to the PACU. And so I started running over there Mm -hmm. and I come to the PACU and there was a person there who was unreal responsive. I had known she was coming. They said there was a stable dissecting aortic aneurysm Mm -hmm. that was coming. And so this was the person and she had gotten to the recovery room because she was about to go into the operating room. And for whatever reason, they put her in the recovery room and they said she just became unresponsive. So I immediately, they had all the equipment there for me. So I immediately put the breathing tube in. I didn't give her any drugs or anything. Mm -hmm. We just put the breathing tube in. And then I jumped on the gurney 
and we started doing chest compressions as we were rolling into the operating room. And as I got into the operating room, I jumped off the gurney. They splashed some betadine on her. I had another partner who was standing at the head of the bed and to hook her up to the machine, to the ventilator. And they splashed the betadine on and then the trauma surgeon just cut her, just a huge mm -hmm. incision. And he took a clamp and he clamped and then we had blood pressure and she survived. And so that was pretty amazing. I thought that was a very memorable thing. And then the other time was, you know, you never know what people are going to say when you anesthetize them. Mm -hmm. And this one gentleman, as I was putting him to sleep, actually asked me, he said, well, I have a Russian wife, but she is not performing her duties as a wife. And I would like to have a wife like you, an Asian wife. Where do you think I could find a mail order bride like you? Oh, and it was nice. about that point in time where I was like, it's time to go to sleep now. We're going to take good care of you. And so then I put him to sleep and my colleagues and the nurses, their eyes were like this big and they're like, man, he needed to go to sleep right away. Oh my it was gosh. Just, it was just, that was, that was something. I've never had anybody say that to me. That was a first. Yeah. So. Uh, that is so funny. I find it so funny where you were watching Grace and Adam, you were like, that will never happen. That yeah. will never happened and, and it did and the person survived which is even better so uh, that was a good experience that reminds me actually Doc, of what happened to me like a month ago and my patient post-op day for i believe in my open heart surgery patient like he was my most stable patient and at 6 45 a.m right at the change of shift the patient went into unprecedented v-fib and he was sitting on the chair already so I went into the room because I got the alert on my phone. I was like, you got to be kidding me right now. And uh, I had to bring him to the bed, compression straight away. And the cardiothoracic surgeons also came and reopened his chest on the bedside. Oh my goodness. Opened up the sternum and started massaging the heart. Oh and, my goodness. And they even pushed Epi straight through the heart and had to wow. do the fibrillator on the heart directly. The code went on for two hours. It didn't regain normal sinus rhythm until one hour and 20 minutes in. And I was like, I always told myself, this will never happen to me. This will never happen to me. And it happened that time. And it was oh. echoing what you said. I mean, the patient is all okay. No brain damage whatsoever. Oh my goodness. That's a miracle. I saw, I saw him on last Monday. He remembers who I am. And it was crazy. Medicine that is just amazing. amazing. And I think in speaking of wild things what's wild that happened so far is the past year with COVID-19 right um, how did your practice change especially being in the hospital when I can imagine just intubation all night because that's what happened in our floor or just what what happened to your practice what, what changed or how did things go on during when COVID started? Well, I think here in Colorado, it was not as bad that, yeah. as it was in New York City mm -hmm. and in New York. But certainly it was when we first got called, obviously we had no idea what we were dealing with. Mm -hmm. And so the first questions were, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to practice? How are we going to handle COVID patients? Mm -hmm. And then they were also asked the question, who does not feel comfortable exposing mm -hmm. themselves to COVID? Mm -hmm. and, if, and they said, if you have underlying issues mm -hmm. that uh, make you immunosuppressed or are at risk, you're, we mm -hmm. are going to let you go ahead and take a break for a little while here um, and mm -hmm. just let other people do the work. And we did have uh, intubation teams. Mm -hmm. And so we did uh, do that. And we were the ones who were called whenever there was an intubation. Mm -hmm. We were called whenever they were going to be proning a patient because mm -hmm. of risk for extubation while proning. And so it was an interesting experience. I've never, ever had to feel like I was at risk in terms mm -hmm. of risking my life in great. Yeah. going to work. Mm -hmm. It's just, it was just not a concept that I uh, mm -hmm. ever expected would yeah. be something that would be, we'd be dealing with. But we were able to get through it, and, and now it's a lot better and so i'm thankful yeah. for that and I, we still all wear masks and yeah. i still wear my n95 mm -hmm. um, because i never know when i'm going to be doing an aerosolizing procedure yeah. But, but yeah it's it's a good thing that we're mostly all vaccinated yeah I'm glad. Yay. <laughs> so let's go in into the crux of the topic. It's the concept of anesthesia. What is it? What is it for? Is it the same as analgesia? <laughs> is Tylenol an anesthetic? What is lidocaine? So what is anesthesia, Doc, from the expert herself? <laughs> There's different types. There's anesthesia where it's local anesthesia, where they numb the area that they're working on. There's also conscious or IV sedation where we give mm -hmm. you medications that some people call it twilight. 
where you kind of are aware, but you don't care. Mm -hmm. And then there's also regional anesthesia where we can, using a nerve block, mm -hmm. numb a limb or an area where they can, and then they can do a procedure. And then there's the general anesthetic when you're totally unconscious mm -hmm. and unresponsive and you don't react to any stimuli mm -hmm. or pain. So those mm -hmm. are the levels of anesthesia. And there's a gamut. It just depends on whatever procedure it is that you need. And we have to tailor it to that patient based on what medical issues that they have. Mm -hmm. Got it. Like, for example, general anesthesia, who would require that as opposed to someone who just needs like a nerve block? Well, certainly people who are having surgery that are extremely painful mm -hmm. or we're going into the abdomen. We also call a general anesthetic for us when we do colonoscopies or upper endoscopies. Mm -hmm. We call those general anesthetics because you are completely unconscious, mm -hmm. and uh, but you're still breathing on your own. We don't put a breathing tube in. That's still considered general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Got but it. we also, for some anesthetists, for general anesthesia, we do have to put it in the tracheal tube and then mm -hmm. also put you on gases to keep you mm -hmm. asleep. Is there already a set amount of anesthesia that you're set to administer, or is that something that you titrate throughout the whole procedure, depending on what it is? We titrate the medications for the procedure and also for the patient, what the patient's mm -hmm. going to tolerate. For instance, if a patient's a trauma patient, we sometimes don't give them very much anesthesia at yeah. all. Just because if they're that unstable and yeah. are hypotensive, they have to earn their anesthesia. Yeah. Yeah. So it just really depends on what's needed for the patient. Mm -hmm. And a common question is, I think it's mostly about general anesthesia, is most people are scared of it. What if we don't wake up after a surgery because of the anesthesia? Is it yeah. true that we can get memory loss <laughs> after time because of the anesthesia? Or is there a direct link to memory loss because of anesthesia, given that it really it really depresses, in a sense, your whole body, right? So really, actually, anesthesia is quite safe now. So I think they were saying, I think I saw risk of anesthesia for death has decreased from 2 out of 10,000 to 1 death per 200,000 to 300,000 uh -huh. anesthetics in the last couple decades. So, I mean, obviously the advancements in medicine has, mm -hmm. has enabled us to do anesthetics quite mm -hmm. safely. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, before the pulse oximeter, I mean, we didn't used to have a pulse oximeter. Yeah. And so we couldn't measure a person's oxygenation. I just remember some of my older colleagues, they said, they would just have to look under the drape and see if they were a decent color. Oh, wow. um, they never had, they didn't Very. have, uh, yeah, they didn't have non-invasive blood pressure mm -hmm. uh, monitoring. Mm -hmm. They had to actually do it themselves manually. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, those kind of things, the monitors that we have, the alarms mm -hmm. that are always going off, I mean, those mm -hmm. are ways that we can keep yeah. people safe yeah. uh, while administering anesthesia. Yeah, and a very curious question, which is actually very interesting is, do you know how people in the past, in history, have done surgeries or procedures successfully without anesthesia? How did they anesthetize these people without the anesthesia that we have now? Are you aware of how they did that, Doc? Well, I mean, they did it without and people just <laughs> suffered. I mean, that's, uh, I can't even imagine. I can't I mean, I mean, they could try drug the themselves with alcohol or you know i'm not familiar with exactly what they yeah. do but i can't even imagine what that would be like yeah so. so does anesthesia cause memory loss is there a direct link to it or a correlation to it yes there is some correlation to some memory loss especially with people who already have cognitive impairment mm. prior to that especially in elderly mm. patients there's some things that can increase the risk of that and mm -hmm. just because of the inflammatory uh, response of surgery itself and that's always a risk whenever you undergo anesthesia or any surgical procedure there's always a risk of of having some issues in fact i just read i just saw something where someone said they woke up from surgery and they were speaking a different had a different accent yeah i've heard of Did that you see that? i've there seen that who's australian and when she, yeah, was, she had an irish yeah, accent. irish accent yeah <laughs> Do you think that's? <laughs> I don't know. I, there weren't very many cases. It's at 150 cases or something like that yeah. in the world. It was just really odd. But um, but no, there's definitely definitely some risks for anesthesia. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes even for spine surgeries, mm -hmm. uh, people mm -hmm. have had mm -hmm. visual issues after mm -hmm. that. Some people have had actual blindness in relation mm -hmm. to uh, after spine surgery, having to do with the pressures and hypotension mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely a risk yeah has any of your patients ever woken up during surgery no not the <laughs> patients that i don't want to wake them to wake up. i mean yeah. there are some yeah. patients who 
I mean, that some patients are actually being sedated. Mm -hmm. And so there may be some periods of time when they actually come up, are a little more aware or awake, mm -hmm. and then they drift back down and as we're mm -hmm. titrating their medications. Yeah. But I've never had anyone who I intentionally was doing general anesthesia on them mm -hmm. tell me later on that uh, they had awareness. It's really quite rare. Yeah. And actually, when oftentimes when I do hear about that someone says, oh, I remember everything. I yeah. remember waking up in the middle of the anesthesia. Usually if I question them, it's because they had sedation mm -hmm. where they were having IV sedation and they kind of woke up in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And then also some people who, during trauma situations, sometimes mm -hmm. they do remember, mm -hmm. but it's, it's awful when someone mm -hmm. actually remembers what's going on mm -hmm. in the middle of surgery because someone forgot to turn on the gas or, yeah. you know, or forgot to give the medications that they were supposed mm -hmm. to be given. It, it's, it's a sad situation for mm -hmm. sure. I'm glad it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. And also like, I can't imagine, imagine being conscious during a painful episode, like physically painful mm -hmm. episode. And I think that links to a question that was asked too was, is it possible to give birth without epidural or any form of anesthesia? Sure it is. Yeah. Sure. Women have been doing it for years and years <laughs> and years. And that's what we offer to people sometimes if they are unable to tolerate us putting in an epidural. We just say, well, mm -hmm. you know, it's okay. You know, plenty of people have had natural childbirth before. I think the main thing is it's important to have a healthy baby. And yeah. a lot of people have birth plans that are like pages and pages of long about how they want to have their delivery. But I think the main thing is to take care of the baby. And if the mother wants an epidural, then they should get an epidural. If they don't want an epidural, then that's okay too. But I do strongly advocate they're going to have a baby. They should have a baby in the hospital. They should mm -hmm. not have a baby at home. Home birth is mm -hmm. not that I would mm -hmm. recommend. At home, mm -hmm. so. Got it. Talking about all of this, which is very inspiring, by the way, you've gone through it all successfully, went through pre-med, through medical school, residency, been working as an anesthesiologist. Do you still go through the concept of imposter syndrome? I think I do. For instance, I got an email one time from my alma mater and they said, hey, we would like you to consider being part of the board of trustees. And I wow. immediately thought, they must be meeting somebody else. <laughs> they must have sent this wrong to me and it must be going to my husband. That's probably who. And so I actually wrote, are you sure you're talking to the right person? Because I'm not sure this is really you. Did you? And they were like, yes, we were talking about you. And so, but um, yeah, I think that's still, that's always going to be something that mm -hmm. everyone is going to battle with mm -hmm. is to have that imposter syndrome. And I think mm -hmm. that's not bad to have to mm -hmm. understand that you have some limitations, but at the mm -hmm. same time, you know, if someone invites you to the, come to the table, come to the table, come to the table, you know? I yeah, I mean, give what you can give and share what you can share mm -hmm. to help other people for whatever mm -hmm. knowledge you can offer. Mm -hmm. So. I agree. You've said it already before many times. It can be really stressful working in medicine, especially when you said that you no longer take your nights anymore, like to go to work. What mm -hmm. are the ways that you decompress from work, especially in a hectic world such as medicine? What do you do outside of work that gives you enjoyment and other passion? <laughs> Well, okay, so I like to go camping, and uh, yeah, so I actually took a sabbatical in 2019 before COVID. We, uh, my husband and I, we have a Vanagon, a Westphalia pop-up mm. Vanagon. You know those Volkswagen mm -hmm. buses, except that it pops up, and so yeah. you can sleep four people in there. Well, we wow. took a almost one-month-long trip, did a loop. We went to from here, from Colorado, and then we went to Yosemite, and wow. we went up wow. the Pacific Coast Highway, California, Redwoods, Oregon, Washington, went to the Orcas Island, and then went up into Banff, and then to Glacier, Tetons, and the Yellowstone, and then came back. And so that was one of our major trips. My husband actually wanted to go for a year. He wanted to <laughs> he wanted to outfit a bus, like a school bus, yeah, and uh, take it for a year. And yeah. I said, you know what, we, we can't do that. I said we can. I said, well, here, what I did, I didn't say we can't do that. I said we need to look at our options and see if we can do that. And then yeah. you need to think about what I'm going to do when I lose my job. <laughs> so can we do this without me losing? Can we do this and knowing that I'm going back to a job? <laughs> and, and so then we decided we, we weren't going to be 
But yeah, so I, I do I like to bake. I was baking macarons last year when I was home. And so I still haven't perfected that. I do some hand lettering, calligraphy, and then I do some real estate on the side too. Mm -hmm. So I saw that. <laughs> yeah yeah so and it's also great to have like like you said it's probably because of that that's why you don't have to take calls that you don't want to take right anymore right yeah, yeah and I, I think that's one of those things that we uh decided long ago that we were going to make an effort to find a way that i don't have to work constantly in order yeah. to be able to have a good quality mm -hmm. of life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we invested in real estate and for other, for other people, it can be other things, but we started 10 years ago. Oh, wow. Then, yeah. Because of that now, it really covers our yeah. annual expenses. Yeah. And so for us, that means we're pretty much financially independent. I mean, I yeah. could, if yeah. I wanted to quit. Just retire, right? <laughs> yeah. But, but, and we'd, we'd be okay. But, but yeah. the good thing is I enjoy doing what I do. And so that's not going to be happening quite some yeah. time especially since i don't have to do call anymore yeah so. and, and i feel like it's a big movement amongst the new generation of physicians as well as having things outside of medicine where they can mm -hmm. also gain money from like entrepreneurships or other real estate ventures as well which i think is very important there's a lot of physicians that have talked to as well it's like oh they're killing their, their selves taking calls and calls and calls and yeah. calls when you're right they don't have to if there's other ventures like that yeah, and like then that's what that that comes back to. Know why you're going into medicine, yeah. and you know don't go into it thinking that it's for the money because that's not what it is. Because really, if if you actually were smart with your money mm -hmm. um, after you got out of college and invested yeah. it regularly, then that compounding interest would really help yeah. you anyway in the long run too. So yeah. depending yeah. on what you're doing initially, but still, anyways. Yeah. But it, it's it's. <laughs> It's nice to have a secondary stream of income, no matter what it is. And the thing about, you need to learn how to do your finance also. And that's not just for physicians, but physicians are notoriously have a problem with keeping up with the Joneses and spending a lot of money, a lot of money that they don't have. And mm -hmm. so then they end up, you know, with a ball and chain of having to work mm -hmm. in order to mm -hmm. pay for their lifestyle. I agree. Dr. <laughs> Jellery, thank you so much. It has been such a fun conversation with you. I have learned so much. Is there any last things you would like to tell everybody, Dr. I do hope somebody is interested in going into medicine. We need physicians and, and it is a very rewarding uh, profession and I really do enjoy it and highly recommend it. Thanks, Chris, so much for inviting me.